All right, so for our next example, let's go ahead and figure out for which values of x does the power series, the sum from n equals zero to infinity of n factorial times x to the power of n converge for. So remember, n factorial is just the product of all the integers from one up to n. So four factorial would be one times two times three times four. Five factorial would be one times two times three times four times five, and so on. So to get the ball rolling, to start figuring out our interval of convergence for this power series, we have to do the ratio test. So we have to look at the limit as n approaches infinity of the ratio of the n plus first term to the nth term for our power series. So what is our n plus first term going to look like? Well, we just take the general term of our power series and replace each n with n plus 1. So that'll look like n plus 1 factorial times x to the power of n. And we have to divide that by the nth term, which in this case, for this example, is just going to look like n factorial times x to the power of n. I forgot that n plus 1 when I first wrote that power of x in the numerator, so got to make sure to include that. So the, in the numerator, we have our n plus first term, and in the denominator, we have our nth term. And so we need to figure out is, are there any x values for which this ratio will become strictly less than 1? And if so, what are those x values? Only those x values will be included in our interval of convergence. And so just like before, we kind of write our general ratio of the n plus first term to the nth term, and then we have to simplify it as much as possible before trying to take the limit. And here we have to do a little bit of manipulation and simplification involving these factorials. So n factorial is the product of all the integers from 1 up to n. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, n up to n. And the n plus first factorial is going to be all those same factors, but then one more. So I'll really write it out for us here, but we can think of n plus 1 factorial as n plus 1 times n factorial, essentially just stripping off that last factor of uh, n plus 1. And then we still have to divide that by our nth term, which we are not modifying at all. That's still just n factorial times x to the power of n. And this is a pretty common tactic that we're going to be using when we're working with these factorials, especially when we have the ratio test and are trying to find an interval or radius of convergence. We are usually going to take the uh, bigger factorial and kind of strip off these higher uh, factors until the smaller factorial shows up, and then we'll be able to cancel out that smaller factorial. And that's what we are ready to do here. We see we have a common factor of n factorial in the numerator, so we can cancel that out. And we can also cancel out n of these common factors of x and only be left with one factor of x in the numerator. And so now our limit is looking like the limit as n approaches infinity of the quantity n plus 1 times the absolute value of x. I don't really need to apply the absolute value to n plus 1, but I still do need to apply the absolute value to x. All right, so we've been doing this ratio test, and so far we're at the point where we have the limit as n approaches infinity of the quantity n plus 1 times the absolute value of x. And here, remember, we're taking the limit as n approaches infinity, not x. So we can treat x as if it was a constant. So we could pull it out of the limit, and then what we really see is that no matter what x is, the quantity n plus 1 itself is going to go to infinity. But remember, in order for us to have convergence using the ratio test, we had to have the ratio test always be less than 1, and what we're seeing here is that's really impossible. This ratio will never be less than uh, 1, so that means we're never really going to converge. The only time that this ratio could actually ever be less than 1 is if straight from the get-go we set all these x's equal to 0. So for this particular power series, we're only going to have convergence at the point where x is equal to 0, and because of that, honestly, this isn't going to be a very useful power series. And so I think in our textbook, we uh, write this as its own separate little theorem, but I don't think it's worth uh, writing down as such. But what we essentially kind of end up seeing here is when we perform this ratio test to kind of find our interval of convergence, the limit that we end up getting out of this is not the radius of convergence itself, it's actually the, the reciprocal of the radius of convergence. So if our limit here goes to infinity, the radius of convergence is going to look like 1 over infinity, which is 0. And if our limit here went to 0, well then 1 over 0 would be uh, 
approaching infinity, kind of not worrying about negatives or things like that. And that's when we would actually have a infinite radius of convergence and an infinite interval of convergence when the limit from the ratio test actually goes to zero. Another way to think about that is if our ratio test went to zero, then it's always less than one, no matter which X value we pick. So it will converge for every X value we pick or all X values that are real numbers. So later on, we're going to talk about how to build power series representations from scratch for a particular function using what we call like a Taylor series or McLaurin series, but it's not always necessary to reinvent the wheel. Oftentimes we can find a power series for a new function by using what we know about a power series for an old function. And that's what we're going to see in this example. In this example, we're going to use the power series, that is the sum from n equals zero to infinity of x to the power of n, our kind of geometric power series. We know that that converged to or could represent the function one over one minus x, as long as we are on the interval of convergence, which was described by the absolute value of x being less than one. So we're going to use this power series, basically the power series for the function one over one minus x to create a power series for a related or similar function one over one plus x squared. Once we create the power series for this new function, we're then going to use that to find the interval of convergence for our new power series. And pretty much all we're going to do here is some algebraic manipulations. So what we know is that if we have one over one minus x, that can be represented by the sum from n equals zero to infinity of x to the power of n. So what we're going to do here is uh, basically replace or substitute x out with whatever uh, expression is needed to turn this into the function we desire. So in this case, if we replaced x here, well, not with x squared, but with negative x squared, then this function would turn into this function. And the idea is this power series would then turn into the power series for one over one plus x squared. And so this is a little bit of bad notation because we're reusing the same variable twice, but what we're essentially doing here is uh, making a substitution. We're gonna substitute all of our original x's with the quantity negative x squared. So for the right hand side or the function that we know our original power series will converge to, one over one minus x would become or be replaced with one over one minus, and then we're replacing x with negative x squared. And well, if we simplify this, this will turn into the function we are trying to create a power series for one over one plus x squared. But if we substituted x on the right hand side, we have to also substitute x on the left hand side, and that'll give us the sum from n equals zero to infinity of not x to the n, but what we replaced x with raised to the power of n, and that's negative x squared raised to the power of n. And so now this really is the power series representation for the function one over one plus x squared. But let's go ahead and simplify it just a little bit before we try to find the interval of convergence. So left-hand side, we can pretty clearly see just by canceling out the double negatives, we'll reduce down to one plus x squared in our denominator. So we do have one over one plus x squared. And on the right-hand side, we have the sum from n equals zero to infinity of negative x squared raised to the power of n. We could also think of this as like negative one times x squared to the power of n. And then we could distribute that exponent of n to each of the factors in our base. So in other words, we'd get negative one to the power of n times x squared to the power of n, which we could write as x to the power of two n. And so this quick little step of simplifying or rewriting our power series representation for one over one plus x squared allows us to see that this really is an alternating series. And now we can apply all those things we learned about alternating series to this power series and this function. Like if we wanted to estimate the value of this function using a partial sum of our power series, well, then we could uh, kind of talk about the error in our estimation using what we talked about uh, related to errors for alternating series, things like that. So we now know what the power series representation of one over one plus x squared could look like. It could look like the sum from n equals zero to infinity of negative one to the n times x to the power of two n, but we still have to find the interval of convergence for this new power series.
And well, we could do something like take the ratio test for this new power series and find the interval of convergence directly using that method. Although usually a more efficient way to do it is to go from our original series to our new series. We just made this substitution. We replaced x with the quantity negative x squared. Well, if we make that same substitution in the uh, inequality that described the original interval of convergence, we can use that new inequality to find our new interval of convergence. So the original kind of geometric series, power series, uh, had an interval of convergence described by the absolute value of x is less than 1. And so, well, now this power series for 1 over 1 plus x squared can have its interval of convergence described by the absolute value of negative x squared being less than 1, right? The same substitution we made to our series to create our new series is the substitution we're going to make in this inequality to find the interval of convergence for our new series. Now we just have to do a little bit of analysis for this inequality. First off, taking the absolute value of negative x squared is the same as taking the absolute value of just x squared. And then we should be able to pretty clearly see that, well, the absolute value of x squared is going to be less than 1 whenever x itself is actually less than 1. And so we see the absolute value of x has to be strictly less than 1 here. So our interval of convergence, which I'm probably going to start abbreviating just by IOC, interval of convergence, is looking like the open interval from negative 1 to positive 1. The only thing that kind of remains to be figured out is, does this uh, series converge at its endpoints? And well, what ends up happening here is if we test the endpoints independently, if we test x equals negative 1, what's going to happen to the terms in our series? Well, these are x values we're plugging in. And we can see we're always going to get this uh, factor of negative 1 raised to the power of 2n, which is always an even number. And negative 1 raised to the power of an even number is always going to simplify to positive 1. So this would uh, basically just give us the series, the sum from n equals 0 to infinity, of negative 1 to the n. And this series is going to diverge by the divergence test because, well, the limit of the terms in our series isn't going to 0, so it has no chance of converging. So that diverges, and we see when we test the other endpoint at x equals positive 1, the exact same thing is going to happen. If we plug in x equals positive 1, we are again going to have our series reduced down to the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of just negative 1 to the n, which we just saw uh, is diverging. So in this case, our interval of convergence is just the open interval from negative 1 to 1, excluding both endpoints. And this is just one example of how we can manipulate a known power series or function to create a new power series for a similar function. We can also do things like take derivatives, take integrals, um, make more than just these substitutions, multiply by powers of x, uh, multiply by constant factors. All these kind of things are going to be fair game when it comes to uh, taking an older power series and manipulating it to create a new power series. All right, everyone, welcome back. So I have another example that I want us to do together where we're going to use that kind of geometric power series to create a power series representation for a similar or related function. So we're going to use the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of x to the power of n, which is going to have the sum of 1 over 1 minus x, as long as we're on the interval of convergence. We're going to use that power series to find a power series for the function 1 over 2 plus x. And in this example, I'm actually going to show us that we can do this in multiple ways. And depending on how we go about doing this, we're going to have different power series representations with different intervals of convergence. And so for our first representation of 1 over 2 plus x, we have to kind of figure out how can we break 1 over 2 plus x down into a couple manipulations that we could apply to our starting point or function 1 over 1 minus x. And so here I'm doing a little bit of algebra to help us see that. We're starting with what we want to have show up 1 over 2 plus x. One thing we could do is pull out a factor of 2 from the denominator or a factor of 1 half from our entire fraction then what would be left inside of our parentheses or our denominator here is 1 plus x over 2. And that would kind of look like with that factor of 1 half pulled out, a lot like our starting function 1 over 1 minus x. We would just have kind of plus x over 2 instead of a negative x there. But if we replace that negative x with negative x over 2, then that would get the job done. 
So here we are replacing x with negative x over 2 and multiplying our entire series by 1 half. So just applying that first step of multiplying both sides of our starting series and function by 1 half is going to give us 1 half times the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of x to the power of n. And this constant factor of 1 half we can bring inside and apply to each term in our series if we want to. And then we have to also apply that same manipulation to the right hand side of our equation. Just multiply it by one half or equivalently multiply the denominator by two. So now at this point we have a power series representation for the function one over two times the quantity one minus x. But to finish uh, this manipulation off and get to the function we actually want to work with, 1 over 2 plus x, we now have to replace x with negative x over 2. And so going from this line to our next line, I've brought in that constant factor of 1 half to each term in our series and have made our substitution of replacing the x's with the quantity negative x over 2. And so that gives us 1 over 2 times the quantity 1 minus negative x over 2. But as we saw in our earlier algebraic work up there, these double negatives would cancel out, giving us 1 plus x over 2. And then if we distributed that factor of 2 inside of those parentheses that are left over, we end up with 1 over 2 plus just x. And so maybe the final thing we can do is simplify the uh, terms in our power series representation for this function, right? Kind of like we saw in one of our earlier examples, that negative x in the numerator raised to the power of n can be split apart as negative 1 to the power of n times x to the power of n. So this is, can, this is the same as the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the power of n times x to the power of n. And then in our denominator, we'd have 2 to the power of n multiplied by an extra factor of 2. So we could write that more compactly as 2 to the power of n plus 1. And so here we have our first or one power series representation for the function 1 over 2 plus x. It can be expressed as the power series, the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n times x to the power of n all over 2 to the power of n plus 1. And so we can see another way to come up with 1 over 2 plus x is just by replacing uh, this x in our original power series with the quantity negative 1 minus x. Now if we distribute this negative sign, that'll turn this 1 and this x into uh, positive versions of themselves. We'll get 1 plus 1, which is 2, and our positive x will, of course, give us 2 plus x in our denominator. So now if we apply the same manipulation to our starting series, we can find a power series representation for 1 over 2 plus x. We just have to replace x with the quantity negative 1 minus x. And so now we know if we replace this x over here with the quantity negative 1 minus x, we're going to get 1 over 2 plus x, and we need to make the same substitution in our power series. So that'll give us the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of not x to the power of n, but negative 1 minus x to the power of n. And again, we could simplify this or manipulate it just a little bit by pulling out a factor of negative 1, or really a factor of negative 1 to the n. And that'll allow us to rewrite it as negative 1 to the power of n times the quantity x plus 1 to the power of n. And now we have a second and different power series representation for the same function, 1 over 2 plus x. I want us to kind of analyze our two power series representations and see if we can spot any differences. One thing we can notice right off the bat is, well, our first power series representation was centered at x equals 0, while this one is going to be centered at x equals negative 1. The other thing that we're going to see, which is going to require just a little bit more analysis, is that these two representations are actually going to have different intervals of convergence. So let's go ahead and find the intervals of convergence for each of these power series representations of 1 over 2 plus x. Let's go ahead and start with our first one. And so remember, the way we created this power series representation was we took that entire series or sum and multiplied it by 1 half and then replaced x with negative x over 2. Well, multiplying by 1 half isn't going to affect a series diverging or converging. It's just a constant factor that we could put in or pull out. The only thing that may affect uh, the convergence of the series or really where it converges or diverges 
is that substitution or replacement we made where we swapped out x with negative x over 2. So remember, the original inequality to describe the interval of convergence was the absolute value of x is less than 1. If we replace the x in that inequality with what we replaced x with in our series, we'll get a equivalent inequality describing the interval of convergence for our new function and power series. So instead of having the absolute value of x is less than 1, we have to have the absolute value of negative x over 2 is less than 1. Well, we can kind of drop that negative sign inside and be left with the absolute value of x divided by 2 is less than 1. And then we can multiply both sides by 2 to see the absolute value of x is less than 2. And so, well, if we write that not in this inequality notation, but in interval notation, that'll look like the open interval from negative 2 to positive 2. And technically, we need to test the endpoints of this interval to see if we have convergence at negative 2 or positive 2. But we can do that really, really quickly um, because, well, what happens if we plug in x equals negative 2 here? Our series would turn into the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n times negative 2 to the power of n all over 2 to the n plus 1. And well, negative 1 to the n times negative 2 to the n is just going to turn into 2 to the power of n. Those factors of negative 1 kind of double negative cancel each other out. And then we have basically the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of 2 to the n over uh, 2 to the n plus 1. We could cancel almost all these factors of 2 out, except that 1 left over in the denominator. And so, sorry I'm a little sloppy here, I'm just running out of space. The terms in our series would always be 1 half, and so we'd be adding 1 half to itself over and over and over infinitely many times, and that would certainly diverge. And we'd see something similar happen if we plugged in positive 2. We wouldn't get the cancellation of the negative 1 to the n out. We would be able to cancel some of these uh, powers of 2 out, but we'd end up with like the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n over 2, and that'll diverge uh, just because the terms in our series don't go to zero. We'd basically just be taking like one half or negative one half, then adding the opposite to it and just repeating that over and over, and that would never converge. So next, let's see what happens to the interval of convergence for our second power series representation for one over two plus x. Well, to create this series, we didn't have to do two manipulations over here. We really just had to do one. We just had to swap out x with the quantity negative one minus x. And so, well, we can take this inequality that describes our interval of convergence and apply that same manipulation. So we replace the x here with the quantity negative 1 minus x. We need to replace this x here with that quantity as well. And so that'll give us negative 1 minus x in absolute value. Has to be less than 1. But again, we could pull out a common factor of negative 1 or cancel out that common factor of negative 1 from our absolute value. And then it's going to look like just the absolute value of 1 plus x or x plus 1 is less than 1. And so for this, we can notice our uh, center for our series is not at x equals 0. It's at x equals negative 1. And we have a radius of 1 as well. So we could go 1 to the left or 1 to the right. And so that would make our initial interval of convergence look like the interval from negative 2 to 0. And we could very, very quickly uh, test the endpoints if we wanted to, to see that the endpoints are also still not going to be included in the interval of convergence. I'm not going to write that work down, but I'll talk about it. If we plug negative 2 into our power series, this piece will become negative 2 plus 1, or negative 1 to the power of n. That'll combine with our other negative 1 to the power of n to just become 1 to the power of n. And we're just going to get the uh, series of adding a bunch of 1s up, which is going to diverge off to infinity. Similarly, if we plug x equals 0 in here, we're just going to get the series of negative 1 to the power of n, which won't necessarily diverge off to infinity, but it will diverge because it'll never approach 0, and we'll just kind of alternate between 1, 0, or negative 1, depending on your starting point or really how you want to work with your partial sums. That's a whole other discussion. So the kind of final question is, well, if we have multiple representations for the same function, which representation do we use, or does it even matter? And well, for that, we can look at the interval of convergence. And what we can notice right away is that our first representation made by multiplying that starting series by 1 half and substituting x with negative x over 2 actually has a larger interval of convergence. We can go 2 more to the right all the way to positive 2 if we want to use this series to represent our function, 
while for our second representation, we are restricted to a smaller interval from negative two to zero. And so for that reason, because we have a larger interval of convergence, I would argue that that first representation might be a better or more useful representation. And so kind of the point of this example was to show that these power series representations for a function are not necessarily unique, especially if we have uh, different center points for our power series. And having these different representations can also lead us to having different intervals of convergence.